the first thing most of us do in the morning is put some pants on. Yeah, most of us. But how should you draw pants, let alone cloaks, capes, belts, buckles, weapons, and armor? It's time to talk about outfits and gear. Cute outfits. They don't necessarily have to be cute. Cute outfits that we all want to wear. Well, I mean, not all of us. You put patches on your jacket. We'll share tips for drawing different types of fabric, equipment, weapons, but first, there are major conceptual considerations here. Not only character design and artistic style, but world building and even plot. Don't just slap pants and a t-shirt on your cast without thinking. Does the space station permit jeans? Does woven fabric even exist in a primitive society that hunts dinosaurs to survive? This is your chance to bring the raw materials of your unique setting to life, mix cultural influences, and create fashions from scratch. Weather and lifestyle exposition can be accomplished elegantly without a word, just by showing what characters wear. For example, some dream keepers in our comics sport leg warmers. They're used as a cartoony design accent, but there's more to it than that. The leg warmers are never worn by royalty in the towers, or even average characters on the street. Seen on Ugrath, Bast, and especially the characters in North Havenville, the common elements is that the characters have been exposed to the elements at one time or another. Hike out on the dunes, and when the wind drives sand into your exposed shins or up your pant legs, you'll understand. In addition to immersing the reader in your setting, use clothing to convey key details about who your characters are and what they do, especially if this clashes with how the characters like to present themselves. Costuming and props present a perfect opportunity to show without telling. One example in our story is Vanth. While it's fun to dream of having wings, it's another thing to have wings instead of hands. Vance's clothing is either loose-fitting or comes with strategically placed zippers and oversized rings for gripping. This not only lets us echo consistent shapes across her character design, but tells us that she lives in a society and with caretakers who can provide customized clothing to accommodate her disabilities. She doesn't put it into her dialogue, but readers can see what's going on. At times, wardrobe goes further and meshes with the storyline. Something innocuous, like Bast's scarf, turns out to be a relic from a defining moment in his backstory. And for the reverse technique, a bizarre contraption like Cinder's neck brace clearly hints to the reader that something happened there and leaves them wondering just what went down. One overall note before we put pencil to paper, this is a key principle that wasn't covered in drawing fundamentals. Contrast. The contrast principle is everywhere. We literally cannot see without value contrast, for example. Contrast exists in writing to balance character personalities against one another and avoid monotony. When it comes to outfits and gear, more opportunities for contrast emerge. If a character has a spartan, elegant design, you can add variation to their look by giving them crinkly pants, ornate armor, or an elaborate prop as a counterpoint. And you can do the reverse. A character's intricacies might pop even more when set against a simple outfit. Will you want the character to have a consistent look? It's usually best to have detailing clustered in areas of greater and lesser density. This adds the equivalent of negative space to the design, letting things flow. Speaking of details and character design, before we get to the pants on in the morning stage, there are body modifications to consider. Characters may have piercings, tattoos, scars from old injuries, even prosthetics. In Dreamkeepers, often Neon Knives gang members will cover themselves with fluorescent tattoos, shaving stripes of fur away as needed. Just bear in mind, if you give a recurring character elaborate tattoos or markings, plan to become familiar with a reference sheet. Often less is more, especially with protagonists that get a lot of page time. This is more on the topic of character design, but bear in mind, if a character is difficult for you as an artist to remember, it's probably difficult for the reader to call it to mind as well. Iconic simple shapes can resonate better. While some world building may leave characters with feathers, plates of wood, or nano spandex, most clothing uses cloth. So let's draw some. Cloth itself can be marvelously detailed, adding sculptural folds, defining the forms beneath. While we could dive into a renaissance rendering, every time someone hops into shorts, many styles aim to simplify. We often use a simple fold at the knee, elbow, or other joint to serve as a visual shorthand for cloth. It accentuates the overlap, helps define the tilt of the underlying shape, and communicates the idea to the reader effectively. But you want the option to add more detail convincingly for different outfits, so don't let an effective style stop your development. There are many kinds of fabric, and they all have a different feel. Silky and stretchy, coarse and stiff, fluffy, flat, tight, loose. Practice variety! 
Thicker material like leather won't drape over every little curve. It gets blocky, simplifying the shapes, and the folds are bulky and more simple. A rule of thumb. The thicker the material, the fewer the wrinkles. You want a leather jacket to feel like a leather jacket, as opposed to a tighter, thinner t-shirt that will express more detail in the wrinkle pattern. When it comes to wrinkles in fabric, they can be a visual goldmine. Fabric will even have different cling properties when dry or wet. If a torso is twisted, fabric wrinkles will strain and show us the torque, while wrapping around the body to define the shape for the viewer. This effect even shows in pant legs and sleeves. Tilt the limb around and you can see the pattern of tension in the fabric. The material gets pulled tight, straining out radially from a point of rotation where it's bunched up and constrained. It's the equivalent of free action lines. Loose billowy fabric creates larger, deeper curves, as it has the slack to hang down in rope-like patterns and arcs. Wet fabric has wrinkles that express smaller, tighter arcs since the moisture makes it cling to surfaces. Dry fabric can have smaller wrinkles as well, especially if it's starched and more crispy. These folds are less organic looking, crunching into sharper, more angular lines, and they don't cling to the surface of the body as closely. Always remember when drawing crinkles and wrinkles, the volume and direction of the shape underneath. If you forget this, all the little lines can subtract from your spatial definition, making the art look more flat and bringing the surface of the piece of paper into awareness. Instead, make every line contribute towards deepening the reader's understanding of the space. Wrinkles are literally the important principle of overlap. That's what a wrinkle is. This is why many total parallel wrinkles that never cross one another look wrong. Usually one fold will be overtaken by another and there's sort of a layered or zigzag effect. Wrinkles will emerge wherever the fabric has some slack, and they will always indicate gravity or momentum to the degree that they can. The only time wrinkles vanish is when they are pulled so tight that the contacting surface of the body presses them out, or if the material itself is actually rigid, and take advantage of dramatic possibilities with capes, cloaks, and snuggies. All fabric will have some secondary motion to it, and the less attached to the body, the more it can show the energy of the motion. If a character is moving fast enough, their sleeve may stretch and drag behind, distorted to help emphasize the motion. So bear in mind, fabric isn't just the thing that makes a character's costume, it's an open window to better illustrate dynamic tension, depth, and momentum. But clothing doesn't just cling to us magically. Buttons, zippers, belts, and buckles pitch in. While the Dreamkeeper style simplifies these accents, we still want them to have a little depth. Simple doesn't mean flat. Use seams in the fabric, zippers, and lines of buttons to define the contours of wrinkles like a road on a mountain range revealing depth. Buttons will protrude dimensionally, and even zippers have a layered effect. Rather than drawing every tooth in the zipper chain, we tend to make it a more impressionistic texture, and instead, focus on the thicker cloth to either side of the zipper where the fabric is doubled up and the zipper is sewn on. This helps give zippers a more dimensional feel and adds yet more overlap and depth opportunities. Belts are the same way, and they're a good opportunity to cluster details like belt loops, buckles, or even equipment pouches. Speaking of which... Unless everyone is carrying their keys all day, there are going to be pockets and pouches. Most pants will come with a couple of waist pockets by default. The Dreamkeeper's style will often make the border of these pockets, as well as the zipper area and the pant cuffs, a secondary color. This just seems to work well from a cartoony standpoint, adding a color accent to the clothing design. Sleeves, cuffs, belts, and belt loops can all be leveraged in that way. Clothing can also pop by incorporating patches, branding, or logos, showing off in-world marketing, and of course, defining character affiliation or rank via uniforms. The Troika, a secret organization, use a distinctive symbol on their clothing so they can recognize one another when necessary. They seem to have an affinity for bomber jackets. The Central City Authority has a range of standardized uniforms from guard, captain, all the way down to shock troopers and police units. Designing uniforms can be an entire source of fun and provide flavor for your world, from stuff that's ornamental to downright deadly and serious. You get to select the officially presented colors, symbols, and iconography of your rulers and their chosen enforcers. Hats are perhaps the most fun accent. A character becomes goofy, outdoorsy, or mysterious with the right hat up there. Wider brims will provide protection from the sun. Ear flaps are good for colder weather. Remember the shape of the head underneath. Sometimes you can even start by sketching the band around their forehead where the hat rests, then sketch the brim as it radiates outward from that point, and the bowl of the hat contains the entire head. This approach prevents the hat from perching on the summit of a character's head. And ensure the brim isn't just a perfectly flat circle, there's almost always a little warp to the hat brim. Sometimes it literally curls around into a cylinder or even gets pinned up on the sides. And even for a rare, perfectly flat circle hat, 
Odds are it'll be tilted at an angle relative to the viewer. For more wardrobe accessories, play with fur moths, chains, bones, skulls, and of course armor. The first image that pops into mind is a medieval suit of full plate armor, but there is incredible variation in protective gear. Even in medieval times, perhaps the most common armor wasn't metal at all. A gambeson was a thick quilted protective shirt. It was also lighter, cheaper, and you didn't need an entire staff in order to put it on and off every time you needed to make a pit stop. Rigid, comprehensive protection involves trading off flexibility. Not to mention increasing weight, which matters if someone is on the move or outfitted for an extended time frame. Envision the specific function of the armor on your character. In Dreamkeepers, the Shock Troopers form a tactical phalanx, so they have massive armor plates on their left side so they make an automatic shield wall. The Troika need a more flexible approach. Their organization is legal, so they often rely on concealable armor vests. Even their heavier armor tends to be smaller than Shock Trooper plates to facilitate maneuverability. When drawing an armored character, the first thing to consider is how the armor impacts their pose. Armor that limits flexibility or puts a lot of weight on the character's frame will affect how they carry themselves and where their limbs might be oriented. Within that range of motion, the armor's position depends on how it is attached to the character. Metal plates can't just magically float on top of shoulders or torsos. What's holding that armor in place? Is it a full vest? Are there straps or buckles? When you know what part of the body it's attached to, then you know where to angle it based on the body's pose. As always, using some real-life references will enrich your understanding and add a lexicon of design knowledge. We've dressed up your cast, now let's give them some gear. Not every prop has to be a weapon. Some characters may treasure an emotional keepsake more than any cannon. And even the smallest talisman could have a momentous impact on your story. One example that's flown under the radar so far, in volume one of Dreamkeepers, Paige gives Mace one part of a matching set of necklaces that she made herself. Every time he looks at it, he's reminded of his dedication towards those he loves. Not every item is there to help characters retain clear memories. Vices can be an important feature. A flask, cigar, or exotic drug can all become part of a character's paraphernalia, or even a tool. Tools don't just help characters do things, they show the audience what the character can do. They can involve advanced technology, magic, or everyday recognizable items. And even the same tool, a hammer for instance, can have a smooth rubber handle or a rough wooden one based on the flavor you're going for. One thing to bear in mind is ergonomics. Tools are made to be gripped and used. Sometimes you may want an awkward, poorly designed tool, but they're not just right angles stuck together. Most of the time there are handles, finger wells, and other convenient design features that make tools look more believable. And of course, mechanical items are a great opportunity to throw a little perspective into your scene. We rarely hold items at right angles to ourselves, so give tools a little tilt and take advantage of the subtle foreshortening and depth. Time for everybody's favorite prop, the personal weapon of choice. Everyone knows the cliche, dwarf, ranger, elf, axe, sword, bow. It's been done to death. Does that mean it's off limits? Don't be afraid of tropes. Another stereotype is cars with circular wheels. A factory aiming at total originality with square-wheeled cars isn't necessarily an improvement. If something works, don't be afraid to roll with it. But do think about it first. Why does it work? Would the character be lugging this weapon all over the place if they're not a professional soldier or mercenary? Where did they get it? How heavy is it? Do they use it? How much munitions or supportive equipment does it require? Does it make them fit in or stand out? If it works in your story, then it's all good, much like the reality of weapons. If you need to inflict some violence, whatever works, works. In a life or death situation, anything around you can be a weapon. A fork, a bottle. If someone came at me with a knife, I'd rather have a book in my hand than nothing. Especially if the weapon is meaningful to your hero or seen often, put a little research into it. A sword can be drawn as a standard handle, crossbar, pointy blade, but there's so much variation, even in reality. Give a nice, tense curve to define the edge of something like a cavalry saber or a katana. There are massive Zweihanders and Claymores contrasted with a stout Gladius or a lightweight rapier. Blades will look more convincing if you draw a parallel line set in from the edge, indicating where the actual blade indents. A groove within the body of the sword, often called a blood groove, can subtract weight from the blade while retaining strength. The blade itself may even have notches, serrations, hooks, battle damage. Even within one type of weapon, a world of variety lurks. Crossbows, and especially guns, are more like handheld machines. This can make them a challenge at times. Guns without detail can look empty and boxy, and random detail usually is not convincing. 
But if you add up safety, a magazine release, a storage compartment in the grip, attachments points for a harness, iron sights or mounting rails, an ejection port for spent cartridges, all of these add believability and heft to your firepower. The mechanical feel can make firearms a fantastic contrast to the organic lines of the characters holding them. A rigid counterpoint to a flowing stance. And it's not all metal. Grips can be of one material or another, and stocks could be synthetic, wooden, or you could get creative and make them from sculpted cave whale clavicles. Rather than drawing your guns fresh from the factory, often you'll want them to feel a little more weathered. Grit and dust can build up around the smaller bits, while the larger areas of metal are perfect for showcasing subtle scrapes and wear. Make your scratchy lines convey this wear and tear while also wrapping around the surface to define depth. This will give your props a nice heft. The Dreamkeepers comic use an unconventional type of projectile weapon, Springer guns. Check out the lore page on our site for more on those. And of course, grenades keep everyone on their toes. Whatever their weapon, a character will often want their hands free. So you will have to consider holster slings as well as accessories like ammunition or sharpening tools. This is a great way to include chunky detail in the wardrobe which has a valid purpose. And while swords don't have many classical attachments, guns are notorious for having everything from scopes and flashlights to smaller swords and even other guns stuck on them. Whatever your weapon of choice turns out to be, make sure your character actually looks like they are carrying something. A solid weapon has weight, affecting how the character stands, walks, and holds themselves. Sometimes when drawing a hefty piece of machinery, you can increase the feeling of weight with your actual line weight. Thicker, darker lines tending to support the bottom edge of the various shapes will Damn, literally make the look item good. look heavier. Just remember, if you give them a detailed weapon, give yourself some good references and look forward to drawing it over and over and over again. Now that your character is outfitted and ready to face the world, we have to draw the world. Future courses will explore drawing tips for landscapes, action scenes, panel layouts, coloring, and so much more. So hit the notification Play. bell, like all of that stuff that Game. tickles YouTube's algorithm Play. and helps you catch yeah, the next installment. Feel free to share with any artists or friends who might find this helpful. Creating comics the Dreamkeeper's way is being offered entirely free, so it helps us enormously when people are willing to share, and we hope this will bring some more awesome comics into the world. Comment below to let us know what you would like to learn about next. We check out all the early comments so we can try to help with questions too. And Liz and I would love to share our comic with you. Check out dreamkeeperscomic.com. Our award-winning fantasy action story is completely free to read, and you can see firsthand how we developed our skills from the earlier comics to the current ongoing graphic novel saga. A huge thank you to the patrons you see listed here. They keep our comic alive and allow us to continue this video series. We'll be sharing sneak peeks of what we're up to in the Backers Only Dreamcord as we create more. Thank you again for listening and keep on creating what you love.